Misnets. That is usually the key sampling thing from a bird standpoint. And as Town mentioned earlier, there are limitations with mist nets. Now this one's not erected. You can barely see the net through here. It's on poles. Town mentioned that it only covers a certain height, so we're missing everything that flies above that. Some of these things, uh, birds that are on the ground will walk under it. And then to give you an example of some birds have fly characteristics where they only fly one or two meters before landing next perch. Well, typically with that group of birds, they'll, they'll fly into the net and bounce out. So there's a real bias, a real shortcoming with just using a mist net. Uh, these pictures were taken by Jacob of uh, here in, uh, th these are from Equatorial Guinea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, birds fly in there unharmed, so if you're doing a marking study, these birds fly in there, you can mark them and release them. Uh, what we typically do is take a, a certain sample, a number of individuals, we want adults, immatures, oftentimes males have different plumage from females, and we want a large enough sample size if you're looking at, say, genetic variation within a population. You may want, a, say, a minimum of 10, individual, 10 individuals of each species. And it depends. And what we're trying to do, one of the take home messages I want you to have, not only from the talks today, but tomorrow when we talk about the data, is you never can anticipate how these specimens may be used down the road. Early on, when people were collecting specimens, they were just documenting where the specimen was on a certain date. But with these new technologies coming along, we are being able to formulate questions that we've never been able to even think of, let alone address uh, that'll come down the pike. Stable isotope analysis is an example of one of them. All these DNA studies that are occurring now, that was not part of uh, the assessment, thinking about how th the specimens would be used even 20 years ago. Here's another picture of, uh, this is Western Mountain Greenville, actually right here in Mount Cameroon. They're pretty common right up here. And we'll typically, depends on the type of environment, we'll put up as many as 25 nets. We try to check those once every hour. And in some countries we're allowed firearms. With firearms, you're able to assess that canopy uh, group of the, the birds, whereas the mist nets, again, with those limitations, you're basically ground-based. These allow us to obtain that mid-canopy and sub-canopy fauna. When we're using shotguns, what we do is uh, quickly, after death on many species, and this is a mountain toucan from the Andes of South America, these soft part colors rapidly change. Uh, the irides, the iris, uh, will often change colors within 15, 20 minutes. And if I showed you a photograph of this specimen later on, you would have lost all this yellow and red and become quite dull. So if we collect them, a bird with a shotgun, we're taking cameras and we're documenting those soft part colors immediately. Here's a camp. This is a multi uh, discipline, a multi institutional group of people. We've got two U.S. institutions and, and we've got several uh, people from Argentina in, in this picture. These two are from Argentina. Uh, it was a high Andean camp we had. This is our, give you inside of that tent I showed earlier. We have these roll of tents, we can actually, or these roll of tables you can roll up and pack them in on either a person can carry them or animals can. And you can see that we're preparing specimens and often that goes into the evening. Uh, typically we go out early, early morning when uh, the avifaun is vocalizing, have our mist nets open there, and then we spend from late morning usually until 9 or 10 o'clock preparing specimens. As Town said, it, birds are labor intensive, where it, generally it takes you an hour to uh, capture all the data from a specimen. Another thing that we, we do routinely, what I'll do is typically get up at five o'clock in the morning. Each morning I try to go to a different site in the area we're surveying to capture the avifauna. And this is not only used for uh, detecting and documenting what's there, but I try to do is I record as many individuals of each species to characterize the vocal repertoire of each species at a site. That coupled with the specimen data, you've characterized the morphology as well as the behavioral component of an avifauna. And 
I'd like to say this is kind of state of the art. Uh, that's a digital recorder, but the fact of the matter is the technology is there already. We just it economically hasn't driven it where what I really should be using there is a cam recorder that has a high quality microphone on it and I point that at every bird and you capture the behavior as well as vo vocalizations. But right now we don't have that capability even though the technology is there. These vocalizations awfully give you, often give you an indication that there might be more, one, more than one species in a complex. This is an ant pitta that's found throughout the Andes of South America not too recently was considered a single species. Well, when we started learning the vocalization of these things, we realized the vocalizations differ from site to site, and now there may be as many as 22 species recognized in something that was considered only a single species. And the vocalizations helped drive that realization that there were more species involved, and the genetic data have come on top of that later on and confirm that indeed we're talking about multiple species instead of just a, a wide-ranging single species. This is a group that we're currently working on at KU. These are uh, pygmy owls. This is uh, Andean pygmy owl. This is a color morph of it. This is the rufous morph. When we started working on this complex, there was only about 20 species recognized. We're going to at least double that. Uh, again, vocalizations were kind of the precursor to realizing that there were other species involved and now the genetic data are uh, confirming what the vocal data were telling us. And so we're going to wrap up that project in the next couple of months uh, and publish the results. Another species, this is called a blue-crowned mot-mot, gets its name from the vocalization, it sounds like it's, sounds like it's doing mot-mot was considered a wide-ranging species all the way from Mexico near the United States border all the way to northern Argentina in the south. Turns out there's a minimum of five species in this and again vocalizations were the key for recognizing that there were multiple species involved in this complex. Here in Africa, this is African goshawk. There are various issues associated with how many species are involved in this and the morphology associated with within each species. So right here in this area, we're interested in knowing uh, what the plumage morphology is, and obviously the genetic data will be layered onto that. To do, uh, probably there'll be cryptic species uh, in this complex. Currently, maybe one species recognize it might be two or three species end to end once we realize what's going on. Another example of a, a cryptic species, probably there's many species involved in this complex. Currently it's considered as this pale-breasted Iliadopsis. I think that's Iliadopsis. Uh, a forest-dwelling species here in uh, African rainforest. This is just a habitat sh uh, to show you that there's microhabitat. And, there, and often when we get to an area, we try to assess how many different microhabitats there are. One of the most obvious ones are bamboo. Uh, this is a stunted forest uh, at a site where had a special group of birds only found in that type of habitat. And this is a bird that's found only in bamboo. It's called a black-capped hemispingus. It's a tanager. It's in a family that's only found in the New World from central Mer uh, Mexico down to Argentina. Again, a habitat specialist. So when you go into these areas, we're trying to assess what microhabitats might be there so we can sample those to get a more complete assessment of what the fauna is at a particular site. This is uh, another bamboo specialist. Uh, this is called a solitary black cacique. I'm going to show you a few shots of just really cool things. This is a, a bird of a family called uh, the Cotingidae. This is uh, and, uh, a Guyanan cock of the rock. The males put on this elaborate display. They clear the vegetation in the forest understory, strip the vegetation of leaves, and they put on these complex displays to attract females called lecking behavior, L-E-K-K-I-N-G. Another shot of the same thing. And again, one of the things we emphasize is documenting these soft part colors when we're doing preserving specimens of these things. This is a barbet. Um, one time this was, you know, I showed you that toucan picture. Uh, not too long ago, ornithologists thought that these barbets were unrelated 
to the Tukans, that they're more closely related to the barbets of Africa and uh, other parts of the world, Asia. Turns out the barbets in the New World are more closely related to the Tukans than the barbets New World are to Old World barbets. So that's one of the things that genetic data have shown us. When we're at these sites, we obviously don't collect any threatened and endangered species. So if you have a low density or threatened and endangered species, what we do is either with vocalizations and photography. This is a piping hornbill. Actually, I believe it's in the forest uh, right here uh, in this area. We'll use photographs to document that fauna. Now, this is kind of show you what I'll lead into tomorrow is this is a trunk full of specimens. Again, we're, we're trying to take multiple examples of each species. And I'll talk about the data we collect from those specimens tomorrow in detail. Any questions about an avian inventory? Again, this is kind of, there's certain aspects of this that you'd only use from a bird standpoint. Obviously, the recording part of things, the herpetologist, if you're doing frogs, Many of the things that I talked about with that would be applied to amphibians. Yes, Dan. I would just add one motivation for doing these inventories to the list that you gave, and that would be that many times the existing documentation, as you say, specimens, is old and outdated. Right. Which is to say, there may not be that information about soft part colors. Very, very frequently, there's no genetic material and tissue right. available. And so many times, even though an area was collected very well 50 years ago or 100 years ago, the documentation is incomplete. That's so yet another motivation for developing these, these modern specimen series. As a general rule, uh, mist nets were not used in avifaunal surveys until after World War II. So, pre-1940s, mid-1940s, ornithologists did not use mist nets, which is a key for detecting a lot of stuff. And as I mentioned, in the 1970s, 1980s, you had the audio recording element brought into this. So these new tools for detecting and documenting the fauna have been coming along as time goes along. Anything, any other questions, or did I fail to cover anything else? When, um, when we have a particular forest area and we want to establish the, the, the mist netting, so how do, which method do you use in selecting the particular area where the mist net will be? Very good question. What we try to do is you look at the, top, uh, the lay of the land and we'll look at the structure of the forest. Uh, what we've learned is in areas where you have real tall forest and there's not much understory, it, you put out as many nets in that as you can, but if you can find a ridge, a lot of times like canopy birds will come down and you can capture those when they're coming across these ridges or birds that are flying up and over. So looking at the topography you've got in a particular site will often tell you, not, not only looking for microhabitats, but also how to capture that fauna that's up there in the canopy. Say you don't have guns, that's the way to do it, is find one of these elevated sites where birds may be passing over. If you've got, uh, you find fruiting trees, oftentimes birds will come down from the canopy to feed in fruiting trees. So when you're out walking, just doing your, say, transects and you find fruiting trees, you'll realize, oh, this is a hot spot to put uh, mist nets in that particular site. Okay, I still have another question. Is it, is it very, uh, is, is it necessary to establish mist netting during the rainy period? It is. In fact, during the height of the rainy season, uh, a lot of times the vocalizations of birds will tail off because, again, many of the birds are tied with an influx of insects, and that's why they're anticipating when the rains come. Usually, as you, any entomologists in here know, there's usually an influx of insects with the advent of the rains. The birds, of course, evolve with that, knowing that for feeding their young, they're going to have maybe anywhere from a couple young to some seven or eight young. They've got to not only feed themselves, but they have to feed all these young. So they, they're tied into that influx of insects. So that beginning of the season, birds, you know, they're vocalizing, much easier to detect. But during the height of the rainy season, uh, 
many of the birds have fledged. Now, if you're looking at plumages, you want to have that juvenile plumage, so you want to probably net during the, the rainy season because you won't have birds in that juvenile young plumage at the beginning of the rainy season because they've gone, they've probably molted from that juvenile plumage to an adult plumage in between the rainy season and the beginning of the dry season. So it, it often depends on the kind of question you want to get from a faunal standpoint. So if a bird is being caught in a net during the rainy, period, uh, rainy season, how long can it stay before, because I know that if a bird is being caught in a net, it's going to suffocate, it might die right. during the process. So how long can it That's a very good survive? question. In the forest, birds can uh, actually, uh, almost an hour, two hours, be fine in that mist net. Now it depends on metabolism. If you have like some of these sunbirds, a sunbird might expire very quickly, maybe after about 30 minutes in a mist net. Whereas something like if you caught a hornbill, it could literally be in there for hours. Now, if that's inside the forest, if you have a mist net out in the direct sunlight, literally within five minutes a bird might die. So if you're out in an open environment, you need to be checking those nets much more frequently. Thank you. Yes, did you have a question? No. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I have a, my question is uh, as uh, birds are essentially mobile, so how many or how many surveys do we have to do in order to have an idea of uh, the population or the diversity of birds in a particular area? Very good question. Now, for many tropical birds in the rainforest, we know that these things now are relatively long-lived. Some of these small birds may live seven to eight years uh, bef before they die. Some of like the hornbills may live 15 to 20 years. On these small uh, passerine birds, they often have a set territory and they will live their entire life on that small territory. And if they're a sedentary species, they will not move very far. But if you've got species that, that primarily feed on fruit, that are tracking fruiting trees, they have much larger home ranges. And so you may have, to, you may have uh, certain times a year when there's not fruiting going on, you may be able to capture them in a relatively small area, but if it's during the fruiting season, they may wander over a large area, and you might have to have a, a longer period of, of running mist nets to be able to capture or detect that species if they have these larger home range. So it really depends on the type of uh, birds you have at a site. If it's mainly insectivorous, you'll be able to capture most of the fauna, but if, if it's highly frugivorous, uh, eating them fruit, it may take you longer to actually assess what's at a particular site. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. I understand somebody, they get hair sacks. When you extract from the mist net, how long are you supposed to be with baton and catching? For how long you should hold them yeah, before. Yeah. Now, if you're going to have, if, if you're dealing with a funnel where you want to mark and, and re, uh, capture those individuals, what you want to do is, if you can, is actually right on the, at, at the side of your nets, if you have your netting, uh, banding operation right there to mark them, you should do it right there instead of carrying that bird all the way back to a camp where that bird is being stressed all the time. So if you're doing mark and recapture studies, I would recommend that you try to do it close to your mist nets where you can get that bird out, measure it, put the band on it, get the data down, and then release right on the spot. Instead of it taking it back to, say you've got a 30 minute walk back to your camp, that bird is going through stress. Also, if it's in a bag, uh, they become dehydrated. Now, if we're documenting we're through specimens, that's not as important. So, you can bring those back to camp and process in there. But if you're gonna release the bird, it, the key is getting that bird processed as quickly as you can, hopefully within a few minutes. You want to get those data and get that individual out there back where it can start foraging again. Particularly if it's in an open environment, it's absolutely key you do that within just a few minutes. Otherwise, that individual may not make it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you establish the mist net, let me take for instance, you are in a particular forest area. How, um, when you establish a mist net, maybe let me say today, so how long can you conduct the survey? Very, about this? very good uh, question, because what we found, and it depends on the type of environment, birds learn where those mist nets are. 
So after we often rotate our mist nets, it, particularly if it's in a low density uh, fauna where the, the species are, the individuals are widely spread for a particular species, you have to m move those mist nets to be able to detect other individuals and other uh, species. So we're moving those mist nets in a rainforest area probably every five or six days we're moving the whole suite of 20 to 25 nets to a new site.